lives. Okay, go ahead and refresh the page. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the flip side of adversity. I am Dr. Virgil Jackson, the CEO and creative behind Living Strong Consulting. And I'm just so excited to be able to have a conversation with a human being that we have transitioned from just being professional um, colleagues to truly sister friends. And her energy brings light into my world whenever we are connected. And her passion for who she is, her identity, and standing in that truth and creating space for others to do the same just continues to inspire me. And so we're going to have a flip side conversation on how do you become a disruptive peacemaker? I know, right? So let me tell you a little bit about our guest. Rebecca Lamar Jackson has more than 25 years of experience in education. Rebecca is a bilingual native oral storyteller for children and adults. She focuses her storytelling from her roots, pulling myths and legends from the indigenous peoples of the Americas, Africa, and the Caribbean. Her commitment to the community involves supporting the arts, social justice, and change, and cultural celebrations. Specializing in early childhood education, Rebecca has worked at the state and national level of early childhood education workforce initiatives. She has taught at multiple institutions of higher education and presented at national, regional, and state conferences focused on ECE, early childhood education, in both English and Spanish. Her positions have spanned from nonprofit support and management to corporate training and state level policy implementation, offering many supports to the Latino, Latina, Latinx, ECE professionals, and supporting entities in their professional development in diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Rebecca Lamar Jackson is an author, an artist, an activist, a curator, and a storyteller. Living in the community within Philadelphia, Re Rebecca focuses efforts on education of young children and teachers and producing art opportunities for all to find their place and peace within the community, the world, and art all around them. Welcome to the show, Rebecca Lamar Jackson. Oh, my word. It is such a pleasure to be here in the presence of you. And I really wish that, you know, when we're all done, I'm going to take that clip that you just introduced me with and play it as part of my shower mix because I feel so elevated. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm so grateful to share the space. And you know what? It is so interesting. And I feel like I can have this conversation with you because you would get it in that so often people will hear all of the things that they have done. I, I will share it out loud to the world because it's an international broadcast. And as they're listening, they often say, wow. Absolutely. I really, that is me. And so I know you have been on a journey of embracing all of who you are through the arts, through education, through storytelling, and through truth 
storytelling. I, I'd love to just begin to open our conversation up with where do you actually get your inspiration to be in and cultivate spaces like that? That's a really, really interesting question. And I think from my experience, inspiration is all around me. I think the goal or my commitment is to sit still long enough to take it in. I think, you know, because we've we've known each other so many years, oftentimes we see each other in passing, passing ships, mm -hmm. because we are doing a lot of work. And I think for me, the best and clearest way that I can connect with my true self is to sit still and take mm -hmm. it in. Mm, creating space to really be present, mm -hmm. which I find is really difficult for so many people yeah. today. And how have you found, so if it's sitting still or getting really present to pay attention to the everyday inspiration, how does education play a, play a role in that? I think for me, my story was really interesting on how mm -hmm. I came into education. I committed to education probably in my bedroom around seven or eight. And I remember doing this and I remember setting up the dolls on the bed and <laughs> teaching them. And for me, it was, I didn't know it at the time, but for me, it was a healing practice mm -hmm. because my experience in traditional school settings wasn't always the greatest. Mm -hmm. And I committed to education because I wanted to make sure that there were spaces for non-traditional learners, learners who have a lot of questions. I'm definitely <laughs> one of those learners. I'm also um, really committed to holding a mirror up to educators mm -hmm. and letting them see their potential in that. You know, when you go through standard education to become certified to be able to go into the classroom that is great and that is wonderful and truly a privilege to be able to engage in that education but there is also very much a part of it where to really sit well in the space you have to be still you have to kind of sit still and let the classroom speak to you mm -hmm. and i think um a lot of the ability to sit still, I'm really learning from my native mm -hmm. connection to the land and the space and the nature around us. And I think uh, if I am in a quick rush for inspiration, you will always find me in nature. The mm -hmm. further away from human noise, the better. And I think, um, again, for me, it's always been there that mm -hmm. desire to want to sit still, but also as someone who has struggled with ADHD, it's very hard to sit still. Mm -hmm. An environment has to be um, evaluated and really felt mm -hmm. to know if that is going to give me the ability to sit still. And after 40 plus years, I get there a lot quicker when I go into nature, when I'm really connecting with the land. So it sounds like as we, and you know, we have had conversations 40 plus, 50 plus over here um, and getting to a place of really owning what I need to be the best version of myself. And when I was younger, I negotiated that with the spaces often and, and wasted, lost a lot of time trying to make something that didn't work for me, trying to fit into it. Mm. So when you think about how you've evolved from that seven, eight year old girl who knew she wanted to be connected to education, how have you, how is your journey of really connecting with who you are and loving who you are and advocating for who you are what are maybe three life lessons that helped you get to this place? I think uh, the first lesson I would say is that you can't do it by yourself. Mm -hmm. 
And I think, again, referencing to my younger years, both professionally and outside in my personal, I think I struggled to not lift the world by myself. Wow. And, you know, again, connecting with nature and sitting still and being inspired, you can really identify things that um, maybe they didn't grow exactly how they were supposed to, but they may have fallen against something else. And guess what that's doing? That's helping them grow up. And so uh, that was a life lesson that I had to learn um, that you can't do it by yourself. And I think that the more that I maximize on that, the more that I strengthen relationships and make that a priority, the more that I am able to sit still longer and continue to get to know myself. Yes, absolutely. So, so I hear community. Um, what else? I think it's also really helpful to be brave. Mm. And uh, I used to think that I knew what brave was. And then I thought that I knew what brave was again. And I'm constantly learning about bravery. And I think for me, bravery is more about the showing up mm. than the showing off. Yes. Can you unpack that? <laughs> yes, because I don't want people to miss the nuances of the difference of that, because when in the work uh, in the work that we do in the spaces that we often have to stand in, recognizing that we don't have to be the loudest, the brashest or be offensive or call people out. I know I'm walking into disruptive peacemaker, but can you unpack what you just said? I think it is so important to recognize the difference between showing up and showing off. And I think <clears throat> professionally, that can look really interesting. And personally, it's even wilder. Mm -hmm. You know, I think in the professional space, in doing a lot of the community building and uh, professional development around topics that are charged, around topics that people haven't been asked about before, sometimes it is crucial for me to show up with sunshine as they're walking in the door, just so they know that it's not a scary place, it's not a cave, I'm not going to bite you, <laughs> you know, and so showing up for me has been uh, my goal in an authentic way, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and we've had lots of conversations um, just about how you present yourself in professional spaces, yes. you know? And I think for me, as a person of color, uh, it has been an area that I have sometimes struggled with on knowing how to show up has been my physical appearance. And um, I think that that's really unique because in my experience, I've learned that just like when you get a gift, the package might look really beautiful, but if you don't like the gift in the box, it doesn't matter. Yeah. And so for the last um, few years, I've really been investing in finding out what showing up looks like for Rebecca Lamar Jackson. And that has been such a beautiful journey. I've been able to um, reconnect with family. I've been able to go home to my tribe. I've been able to do a lot of connection, but it required me to show up and show up authentically. And, you know, to unpack the show off piece, I think it's been very important for me as I'm meeting new people, particularly um, family members and tribal members that I remember how the energy is flowing. You know, yeah. when you're a guest in a space, sometimes pointing out things or being loud or clapping your hands, that does work and that there are purposes behind that. But sometimes it's more valuable to be in the space and be on the outside kind of watching and taking it in. And as I've gotten better at that practice, because I am still learning, <laughs> I am still learning. But as I've gotten better at that practice, what happens typically is when you're showing up authentically, and you're pausing and you're reflecting, when it is your time to speak, you get right to the point, 
people are on the same space and on the same um, ground as you, and then you're able to lift them up. And I think in a lot of the community work, while yelling and screaming and shouting will make everybody come out of their house, if you don't have anything really important to say, they're going back in their house. You haven't really done anything. And so figuring out the balance between showing up and showing off really is about that disruptive peacemaking. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. there is a part where you need to bring your warrior energy. Mm -hmm. And there's also a part where you need to bring your peaceful energy. Mm -hmm. And I think what has been really beautiful in the last uh, three years is I'm learning how to contain those energies together. Yes. So I heard, um, don't try and do this, whatever your this is in your journey. Um, don't try and do it by yourself. Community is so important. And then recognizing bravery, being really clear on the difference between showing up and showing out. And you got to love what's in the package, not just the wrapping. It, the, the beauty of the gift is when they both match. Mm -hmm. Do you have one more? Uh, I'm, I think I, I can find one for sure. Mm -hmm. I think one thing that I children have taught me, yes. um, best, best advice givers ever, because they get straight to the point. They don't mess around. And then they look at you like, I already gave you the wisdom. What, yes. Why aren't you moving? <laughs> so, uh, my uh, space with little ones has really taught me to get low to the ground. Mm -hmm. Just get low to the ground because that perspective matters. And I think in my native energy, that means so much more to me now. Uh, because when you are really up here in the sky and the clouds with the laptops and the computers and all of that, you miss a lot of the energy that's coming off of the land. And I think many times where I am at right now, getting low to the ground allows me to rest just allows me to rest. Think about where your bed is in relation yes. to upright or laying down. You're closer to the ground. And so I find comfort getting close to the ground. And that can look many different ways. I am always up for a good cave adventure as well. The tour kind, not the whole, I'm going to go with a thing on. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm not I'm, doing that. I'm, I'm not that's doing a different that. kind of bravery. <laughs> I, that's a different kind of brave me. I'm just working on this this right now. Yes, but getting low to the ground for pers a shift in perspective that's it. That's as it. well as it better allows you to get to a rested mm -hmm. place. Powerful insight. The This conversation of nature and art and, and education, what role does activism play? in relationship to art and education? I have grown in different spaces with my activism. I started really leaning into activism after the murder of George Floyd, mm -hmm. uh, but I didn't know how or what or when to say things. And so I did a lot of trial and error in creating um, different opportunities for other writers to share uh, their journey, creating my own pieces, um, doing some different art pieces around it. Uh, and I think where I'm at now, art is really my jam with activism because for me, I love how art is interpreted in its own unique way. But as, again, someone who has been disruptive many times in my life, there aren't many rules to art. So you can play around and, you know, when we're talking about um, the showing up and showing out, you can show out a whole lot and it still be in a safe zone when it's still on the canvas or it's still in the space or it's still in the three minutes. Uh, and I think my activism has taken new shape in that place. Uh, a lot of my activism right now is, uh, you'll find it in my paintings, and I am using my uh, tribal language as a part of the paintings. Uh, 
Um, and again, the, those are pieces that will help bring our language back. And so I'm hopeful that they'll be able to be on display at some point. Um, but that activism is so beautiful because it's really about taking up space. And I think my new plan, my new opportunity is really teaching and sitting with others to learn how to take up space. If you want to be disruptive with that, or if you want to sit in, in peace, taking up space is absolutely activism. Yes. And, and I feel like that imagery that you just gave me of recognizing that your voice, your activism, your power um, can all be connected to an artistic or creative expression, and it is there. It is out there for others to interpret mm -hmm. and can also begin to stir conversations Absolutely. that then disrupt someone's prior thinking mm -hmm. or the framework, the narratives that they've been operating in. So you've been really committed to this journey of unpacking how to show up in spaces in such a freeness. That is something I absolutely love about you. I love how you are not afraid to do the work on yourself, to voice that you're doing the work, and then truly be a person who stands in such a place of freedom and authenticity whenever we are talking. So it just blesses me. But that took work and you've and you've referenced your tribal people. And so that it sounds like that took you on a journey in and of itself. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. Uh, that journey is very unique for a few different layers. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just referencing that we're going to go through a few layers to get to the <laughs> just truth. So you know. Just, just so, so you, know. you know. Hang on. We'll get there. I promise. Uh, so I think it's important to say that in 1978, ooh, it didn't hurt. It just pressure. It didn't hurt. It was just some pressure right here. 1978, when I was adopted, I was adopted out of Wilmington, Delaware, and I had very limited knowledge on my birth parents, uh, but was adopted maybe six months after being born and then um, moved to Pennsylvania with my adoptive family. My, I am a transracial adoptee. And so for your audience to know transracial means that the family that I was placed with was a different race than I was. Uh, this is unique because I am tribal. And so we may talk a little bit about that at another time. Uh, but about a year ago to the day, I reconnected with my birth family. And mm. that in itself was such a journey. And I think that is the journey that taught me a lot about being brave. Yes. Wait. <laughs> Wait, I don't so think we've unpacked that. We have not unpacked this. over coffee or tea we or Caribbean food, coffee. and we have not unpacked have this. Not yeah. Unpacked. So yeah. So a year ago, yeah, at what right age? Around forty-five. At forty-five, mm -hmm. you reconnected with your birth family. What? What is the most remarkable thing you recall or the sensation? you remember from that experience? I think it was a two part. Mm -hmm. I think that my birth family uh, was just so loving mm -hmm. and so caring. Like 45 years had not just happened with me not connecting to them. Uh, and so that love was so immense that there was a shock value or shock factor as well. Mm -hmm. You know, it was almost like, and I'm not sure uh, if, if you connect with this, uh, but I always thought that I wanted to be in theater and I would try out for these major roles. And then, um, you know, if that, that experience of being on stage and playing a role and then wiping the makeup off and then putting your jeans on and going in your car and going to get up. 
usually a milkshake. I usually always had a milkshake after performance night. It felt like that because for a long time, I really thought I knew who I was. And then for an even longer time, I had no idea who I was. And so to ground with family that looks remarkably just like me. And so that was a huge Whoa. shift. And I will I will plant this for your caretakers, educators that are that are in your audience to really think about how they might be making space for children that are in foster care or that are going through or are adopted because that lens is very unique. And oftentimes my experience had been to try and fit a role. And so when I finally came home and everybody looked like me and they had the same laugh as me and I would go in my aunt's house and see all the pictures of my mom. She's passed, um, she passed about a decade ago my mom and my grandmom, it was very surreal. And I think that as much as I did not think that race played a part of my life, the last year and reconnecting with not only my family, but my community has really taught me many things about that. It has really taught me that Perhaps it's not that it was a, a big deal. Perhaps it's more that I was able to desensitize myself to it and really prepare to go into spaces where not many people look like me. That in itself is a huge piece of taking up space and knowing the difference between showing up and showing out. And so to go back home to Seaford, Delaware, um, was extremely humbling, but I was able to sit still and I was not expecting to be able to sit still and just take it in. And so as we're talking about being present, as we're talking about, you know, what are the techniques? How do we get there? That was a huge surprise how present I was able to just remain knowing that um, this was part of that seven-year-old young girl's dream that, you know, one day this will happen and this will happen. And so to reconnect with family retaught me about family mm. and what it is and what it looks like and how it can shift and how it can move. And I think it's given me more compassion to all kinds of families because, you know, as I'm, I'm getting ready for my wedding in September, the guest list is like, there are multiple families that are going to be there. And that's really when I can kind of stand back and say, wow, like you really did this. Like you really went home, you really grabbed some people and now they're celebrating you. Yes. Yeah. That is such a beautiful mental image um, of, again, bravery. I think going into that space at, you said, 45 um, and the remarkable moments of actually standing in a space where people look like you. When I recognize oftentimes I will explain to other educators the, sometimes the mask that children, mm. um, or even myself, adults have to put on when the room doesn't look like mm. them. Mm -hmm. um, and how that safety, connection, community, transparency, honesty, bravery, all play such an important part in allowing people to one, explore the truth, because you can lose track. Absolutely. Mask on, mask off. Sometimes I'm walking around with a mask in, bo in both places, mm -hmm. never finding a safe place. What do you hope in this space that you're in now, having done this work, having gone on this journey, what do you hope early childhood educators are able to learn from you? I think it's really important for educators to spend the time to get to know themselves. Mm. 
not solely as an educator, but as a human, because you're doing human work in the classroom. Yes, you're teaching concepts. You are teaching them things that will help them in the adult world, but it's also this wonderful, magical place where you can talk about things with children. You can give them opportunities in the classroom to express themselves in ways that they had no idea. And I would fundamentally encourage teachers to have that same mindset. You know, I remember when uh, my approach to early childhood shifted um, and I was educated old school. And then uh, I think I apprenticed in the new school. And so I have a little bit of the mix. And I remember feeling so free when we started celebrating open ended projects. Yes. And I think for children that may be walking a similar journey that I had in my years where they're not seeing people that look like them in their home space in their most sacred place. And um, even though there's love and there's great intent, there is possibly a disconnect there. I think it's important for educators to always be willing to self-examine and continue to get to know themselves. If you would have asked me two years ago that we would be having this conversation, I would have said no. <laughs> if you would have told me 10 years ago or 20 years ago that this is how our paths would cross, I would probably laugh. I would not take it off the table, but I certainly would not have thought that the journey has been the most important learning that I have done. It hasn't been the letters at the end of the name. It hasn't been the awards. It's really been about what are the lessons I've learned about self and educators, if they can remain committed to constantly learning about themselves and the young people in their room, in their space, in their community, then they are passing love forward in the community. Yes, because that work I think about, and I'll just speak for myself, that work is humbling and cultivates compassion. Absolutely. And if those are two leading characteristics in a classroom, you will get to content. Absolutely. You will get to content. You spoke of indigenous roots, your tribe. Who are they? What did you learn? What was the experience of truly going back into your roots? Absolutely. So I'm so proud and honored to be a member of the Nanakoke Indian Association. So we are located in Millsboro, Delaware. We are a pretty large association. We're about a thousand members strong all over the country. And I even believe the world. Um, and I think the most powerful thing that I can say is they have taught me everything about community. Mm -hmm. I really thought that I understood community from living in it because I have lived in community and tried to cultivate community everywhere. In this community, it's very different. And in this community, the ability to be young and wise at the same time or playful and serious or caretaking and actively engaging. I think I've had so many great opportunities to be in spaces with not only people that look like me, but that have a similar connection to the land, that have a similar connection to each other because I can tell you this, and I wouldn't have been able to tell you this a year ago. I can tell you that I might have been removed from the Native community, but the Native community has always been in me. And my adoptive parents were incredibly loving and amazing human beings. And they didn't know what they didn't know. And there weren't trainings out there for parents in the 80s. There weren't people to talk to. There weren't movies showing adoption. And so they really, really brought me up in love and kindness and I am so grateful and I am so grateful for more family that I'm connecting with. And, you know, this really closes um, some chapters for me and some mm -hmm. of the wondering, uh, but it also opens some chapters. You know, I think my most favorite thing that I have learned about 
my tribe has been really honoring and learning about elderhood and Mm -hmm. learning about how wisdom is passed down. And honestly, it has been a challenge because I have I have a few degrees Mm -hmm. and that learning is wonderful and I love it. And it really doesn't mean anything in this community. And it's not that it's not valued. I'm not saying that it's not valued. It's just that's not the purpose of that community. And so, again, um, really kind of thinking about the balance of disruption and peacemaking. Mm -hmm. You got to know when you're there to be peaceful and you got to know when you're there to lean in, maybe ask some questions that people aren't comfortable with. Right now, in my first few months, my first year grounding with the tribe, I'm in all learner mode. I am ready to engage. I'm ready to connect with elders. I'm, I uh, am learning the language and it is really beautiful. It's kind of like, um, when you got that uh, that opportunity that you were really hoping for. Um, but this is a little bit different because this is a not, it doesn't have an expiration date. You know, when right. you get a grant or you yes. get an opportunity or, you know, you get published, it has a, a shelf life. And this joy that I have from connecting with my tribe, it's just, it's just so empowering to know it keeps going. It's going to go seven generations after me. And, um, you know, we we haven't talked about the mother space that I have, but I will say as a mother who always knew that I was adopted and, and you know, uh, really have told my children as much as I knew, it was such a remarkable gift to give them their identity. You know, you said it when we first started. Mm-hmm. Identity is so critical. And you may not know that at first, but it'll come around. Right. It'll come around. And how to be brave as you even begin to have internal questions. Mm -hmm. It's so amazing. As you were, you literally were saying what I was thinking. I was like, she has always been so connected to the earth, to the water, to the sand, to the trees. It all makes sense. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Yes. It just, it, and I think, I'm so grateful, so, so grateful for my adoptive family, for the creator who constantly and continuously replenishes this land and for all of my family and friends who have given me space to explore. And I think that that is another word of wisdom to the to the educator, you know, Mm -hmm. that you open your arms, open your heart. Give space because the kids that you're interacting with, even the adults that you're interacting with, they might not even know the space that they need to take up. And I think I'm learning that a lot right now. Do you have a definition of disruptive peacemaker? I do not have a short answer definition for you, but I can tell you the origin of it. Yes. So I was watching uh, Sunday morning on CBS. Oh my gosh, I feel like you're old. Whew, I'm a little <laughs> old. <laughs> I'm not. I'm a little it. old, and I hope CBS gives me some money for dropping their show <laughs> or you some money, actually. <laughs> Uh, So I was watching, uh, they were doing a piece on an up and coming uh, comedian. And I really, really give space to artists because I think that they're truth tellers. And if you sit with them, they are some of the most authentic people that you will ever have the privilege of sharing space with. So when they were featuring this comedian, she uh, was talking about how she came up with putting this one woman show together because it was a big shift. And she said, um, and then my coach came in and said, you're a remarkable understudy. And she took Mm -hmm. that slight as a slight when she first heard heard it. Mm -hmm. And then she talked about in her wisdom how those two words kept her in the game Mm -hmm. and kept her trying over and over. And so this probably happened January. And so I went on this search for two words to just kind of help me keep going. And I think this is a line in a song, but they're two separate lines. And it just hit if this if there were two words to define what I'm doing right now. I'm being a disruptive peacemaker. And I think 
part of my activism is to rework what the term disruptive is. Because that seven-year-old little girl, do you know what her comments were on her report card? Oh. I bet you can guess. I, you go ahead and tell us. They pretty much said, always disruptive, does not know when to stop talking. And so I remember at seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. How do I get rid of that? Because mom and dad get so angry when they see it. How do I not disrupt? And I was sitting in some space with some really amazing human, amazing human beings. And I said, you know, I'm disruptive. And another person said, yes, I'm disruptive too. And I was like, oh, I didn't mean it like that. But yes, I can be disruptive. And then I put power behind it. And the beauty of finding your words or finding your art or finding your passion or finding your purpose is you get to define it. And disruptive peacemaker is the way that I choose to define myself. Mm. So maybe that was a short answer definition. But it, it, it went deep because as I think about identifying two words to keep you going, to keep you moving, to keep you in this process of being present, of showing up, because there, this work is hard. Mm. Mm. And so to identify two words that on face value don't seem like they should go together, Absolutely. but when you have given yourself the space to do the work, to understand how they are defining your push forward, it then makes perfect sense. So it, it really just needs to be, it just needs to make sense mm -hmm. for you. Yes, absolutely. For you and yeah. other people need to just create space mm -hmm. for it to make sense for you, even if they don't understand. Absolutely. What do you hope the artists you encounter, what do you hope they gain from a relationship with you? Because you're really intentional with creating platforms and opportunities. I really hope that artists, all artists, mm -hmm. can hold the idea that there is room and space for all of us. And in a lot of my storytelling, I will ground us a lot in there is space in the forest for all, all of us. Mm -hmm. And there are so many things in the forest. And so in the space of art, I hope that they can feel encouraged and want to lift other artists up with them. Mm -hmm. That's the goal. Mm -hmm. you, you don't have to be by yourself. And quite honestly, after the last three years, maybe we shouldn't be doing things on our own all the time. You know, and so I feel so empowered again to bring community and maybe to give space for others to understand community differently because community, just like family, can be defined by you. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to come out of a dictionary. It doesn't have to come off of the Internet. You can define what that looks like for you. And I think it's a word that our culture often throws around. Um whether it's in order to launch an initiative or to start a self-reflective journey, it's used a lot. And, and so when you think about what does community mean to you now? I think community can be all encompassing. I think it can be small and large at the same time. I think it can be close and far at the same time. I have begun to think about community not only in one way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And after the last three years, uh, you know, with COVID, I think I had a yearning for community that may have prompted me to do some things, to gain a community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when that can happen, that spark, I can, I love the idea that others are community builders as well. And so now the space is, 
where are the change agents, where are the community lifters, not only because there's work to be done, but also because there is rest to be had. Rest Ooh, to say be had. That again. Because <laughs> I tired. Yes. <laughs> but sometimes we don't allow right. ourselves right. or give ourselves that permission um, because it seems like showing out is is such is almost the standard when there is still such beauty. And even in the one who desires to share with others, you can't share what you don't know. And so you said something earlier of around um, having to, all of the credentials, the degrees, the things you had done actually had to be put aside when you were introduced to your tribal family. And because that was not their priority, that was not the thing that was at the center. Mm -hmm. And I think there's an opportunity for people listening to think about what will be the priority Mm. of your community and get intentional about cultivating it because I have asked women to give me seven things that have about them that have nothing to do with their credentials, their jobs, their titles, or their responsibilities. And I've had women cry at just trying Mm. to think of seven. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for me, that's, that's cultivating the inside of the box. Mm Mm-hmm. That's cultivating the inside of the box. Absolutely. And I think if you are, I'm not sure masking is exactly the word, but it's the inauthentic self. Mm -hmm. Taking up space with your inauthentic self. That is what it is. It can be hard to hold multiple narratives in the same space. You know, and so as I think about which space or which energy to lean into, I think that's why it can be really important to get down low to the ground. Because sometimes when your head is in the clouds, when you are receiving many accolades, when you are being honored over here and doing this over here, if your feet aren't on the ground, you're going to trip. Mm-hmm. You're going to trip. Mm-hmm. And whether others see that or not, you're going to feel it. Mm-hmm. So it won't matter yeah. if there is uh, someone who can figure out that you're not being authentic. That won't matter because you're going to feel that regardless. You said something really impactful. You know, the energy that it takes to show out, that takes a whole lot more energy than it does to show up. And I think finding the balance of how to use both of those hopefully will allow for some intentional rest to happen because we can't, I can't, I won't say we, I can't, I can't be at show off or show out energy too many days in a row, or I'm going to get sick and I'm going to need to take a few days off. Mm -hmm. And so I think in the sense of community, it's also really important to be aware of the skills and talents of those around you so that you don't have to feel like you're doing all the work or you're the one, the only one showing out. That balance is really critical. Oh, the ability to, to recognize that if you are not grounded, you're going to trip. I just watched somebody fall. So <laughs> somebody just fell. Can you think of a time that you're willing to share? Can you think of a time in which showing out you knew it was a mistake and but it taught you in the moment i'm not doing that again yeah i think um the one that is coming to mind is really about relationships so Mm -hmm. i um was starting out a project with a group of individuals and 
I had thought that the email that went between uh, all of us on the project had set all of the expectations, the flow, the energy, everything. And so come the first day that we were meeting, I'm ready to dive in, jump in, move everything. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Uh, And what I didn't realize is that some of the team members had changed. Some of them had been on vacation and had never received this email. And so what came in the room as we were getting ready to plan this project was a completely different energy Mm -hmm. that I had anticipated. And it irritated me. And I think this is the learning space for me. So I am very, I'm in, I like to call it um, manager mindset, manager versus leader. So I'm in manager mindset. I'm ready to get it done. We got short time. We got deadlines. I got to go somewhere in four hours. We need to get it done. And so what came in the door that day in July was uh, different individuals that came from different spaces. Mm -hmm. That is not how I interpreted it it felt to me being in education as long as I did is these were the seniors a week before graduation. Ah. So, and again, some of you that are listening may remember if you're in a classroom or you have been in a classroom or you have children, maybe you are a senior that last week before you're about to graduate. (laughs) I can't tell you anything about that week because I may not have even been there. (laughs) I don't remember. Checked out. Right. And so when the group came in, the issue was that I caught an attitude Mm -hmm. and I knew that I caught an attitude. And I think my, uh, I know myself and I know my energy and I'm catchy. So whatever I bring into the room, typically it doesn't take too long for that energy to Mm -hmm. transfer. So in about 20 minutes, we all had attitudes. (laughs) I don't know about you, but it's really hard to get work done when there's any attitude in the room. And so um, we we forced work. Mm-hmm. And that's not a practice that I like to do anymore. I used to think that that was the standard to force instead of flow. Mm-hmm. So we attempted to force work. It didn't work out well at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was irritated, to say the least. Mm-hmm. I went home. Nothing got done. I'm ready to throw the towel in. And I have a conversation with my supervisor and she's like, oh yeah, so-and-so just got back from vacation and -and so-and-so just got off a maternity leave. And I'm just sitting with all of that because I didn't see the humans in the room. I did not see the humans in the room. I saw a problem in the room. I saw a not focused in the room. I saw a not taking it seriously in the room. And so it took me going through the whole four hour work session, a whole night, not sleeping well, because I don't know if you've experienced this, but when you go to bed with an attitude, you're not getting good rest. Mm -hmm. Went to bed with it, woke up with it. My supervisor is talking to me and I was like, oh my goodness, Mm -hmm. I'm embarrassed. I'm humbled. I showed up and showed off in this very, very forceful way. And it took me a minute to really shift and think about if I was coming in the door and somebody barked at me the way that I was barking at them, would I want to come back and work? Right. Would I even want to respond to an email? Right. Any of that. So I made a decision to be very open mm-hmm. and email the group get together um, a Zoom meeting to just clear the air. Because I think that in community work, whether you're bringing people together around a project or you are planning a church somewhere, Mm -hmm. it's really important to have an understanding of the community. And the community work won't work if there's no community. And when I was in that room barking orders, there was no no community in that room. (laughs) So I think for me that pause and self-reflection and really thinking about that I may have messed up, Mm. that gave me the growth and uh, the bravery to call myself out in front of this group and apologize because I was was not presenting the way that I really wanted to be presenting. Mm. And, you know, it is never too late to say that you're sorry, but that doesn't mean that the person has to take it. And so Mm -hmm. in that space, I had to be ready for others to give me their 
sentiments as well. It did not go that direction. I think in the professional space, we're not used to vulnerability. And so when someone breaks down, it kind of shifts us. I really encourage that kind of behavior. I think there is space in certain uh, environments in the professional world to unpack things, to have discussions, to be personal with it. Yeah. It's okay. This has been an amazing conversation of authenticity, of um, humanness, of a willingness to abandon pride and really see people. We have about 30 seconds. Can you tell people how they can follow you, how they can connect with you? Absolutely. You can find me at skirtinthedirtstorytelling.com. You can also follow me on Facebook at Rebecca Lamar Jackson. So there you have it. I tell you, you might have wondered what a disruptive peacemaker is. What what could that possibly be? You just got 55 minutes of a full definition, and I hope it created a flip for you. You know what? We're going to continue this conversation on Facebook, so jump on over there. But for the rest of my listeners, same time, same place, next week on the flip side. We'll see you then. Thanks, Jordan. Have a good one. Thank you. He said, have a great rest of your okay. day. <laughs> I love the hearts. Please keep the hearts coming. So I always ask one additional question um, for our guests that only Facebook gets to hear. And I'm curious, you started our conversation with that seven, eight-year-old girl and you've challenged educators to see or explore their inner selves as they're working with um, especially children who are in foster care or adopted. I'd actually like you to speak to the person who is the one who has been adopted who is struggling with self-acceptance, uncertainty, what is something you would leave them with as a disruptive peacemaker who has been on a journey of really learning herself? What advice or wisdom would you offer someone who has been adopted and, and not feeling connected with who they authentically are? I think that they should know that they're loved. Mm -hmm. And it might be hard to feel that on a regular basis in the way that they understand it. Uh, But I would really encourage them to know that someone is thinking about them, even Mm -hmm. though everyone might have told Mm -hmm. them that they were not thought of, that it's a closed end of the chapter, there are no answers, there are no next steps. I would really encourage them to know that someone is out there thinking of them. Mm -hmm. And when they're ready, that journey will start in the way it's supposed to start. Mm -hmm. And allow it to be, Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, sister friend, I just, I, I, as I shared in my post, I, you just bring me light and joy. And so thank you for being so open, transparent, honest, and sharing so much of yourself with our Flipside community. Juanishe, that's thank you, and Nana Coke, gracias, and thank you so much. It's been such an honor to share space with you. It's been a long time coming. It has. <laughs> we have been talking about this for months, people, for months, and it has finally happened. It's not going to be the last time, because because you promised me an island version. Mm, I show. definitely did. Yes, I you did. Definitely yes, you did. did. So stay tuned, y'all. Stay tuned, y'all. Y'all might see me on an island. We'll do the flip side on location. <laughs> well, as always, thank you so much, um, our 
Flipside community for following, for listening. Please make sure you share this um, and drop the hearts, the comments, so that we can continue to boost this conversation for many who are really trying to find their space. I think there's a lot of wisdom they can gain from this. So we'll see you next week. Same place, same time right here on the flip side.